everyone. I'm Rhonda Gerard, longtime Googler and Palestinian American. And as part of Google's celebration of Arab History Month, I'm honored to be hosting a conversation with Reem Asil, a multiple award-winning Palestinian Syrian speaker and chef based in Oakland, California. Reem's work sits at the intersection of food, community, and social justice. With food as a tool, Reem uses Arab hospitality to build strong, resilient community. And she just published her first cookbook, Arabiye, Recipes from a Life of an Arab in Diaspora. It's a beautiful collection of over 100 bright, bold recipes influenced by the flavors and culture of the Arab world. And as any good cookbook should be, it's also filled with stories on food, family, identity, politics, and passion. Welcome, Reem. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Rhonda. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Reem, you hail from Palestine and Syria. Tell us a little bit more about <clears throat> your, your roots and your upbringing. Yeah. Um, so I was born in a very, very small town right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my parents immigrated here in 1982. Um, my mother is from Gaza and um, she comes she comes from a long line of Palestinians on my grandmother's side. She uh, was from Yaffa and um, during what we call the Nakba, the 1948 sort of takeover of Palestine, she was relocated or displaced to Gaza where she met my grandfather. And then in 1967, um, they, uh, they fled to Lebanon and Beirut was her home. Uh, you know, in the midst of the 70s, which, uh, as people might know, was a civil war in Lebanon. Um, my father was from Damascus and um, always had an affinity for social justice. He left at a very early age. He was lived in Egypt and he relocated to the States to become an engineer uh, in the early 70s and then went back to visit where he met my mom in Lebanon. And uh, they had decided, you know, life in war and um, displacement was not not the life to live. So they came back, they came to the US and the first place they lived in was Lancaster, Pennsylvania, <laughs> which as anybody knows, uh, was Amish central, a, a very um, a cultural shock to say the least, but um, they eventually relocated to the East Coast where I was born. Wow, um, so much so much history in um, your family story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and what ended up inspiring you to pursue a career in, um, in food initially? Yeah, well, you know, I think like any other Arab immigrant family or immigrant family to, uh, in general, when you move to the States, it's, it's hard to not, you either assimilate or you try to keep the culture really strong. And, and for me growing up uh, in New England, um, in the house, the Arab culture was really strong. <laughs> um, so my earliest memories of, you know, Arab culture was always through the food. You know, my mom, um, did everything she could. She was a working mom, but did everything she could, could to make sure that we knew where we came from. And so um, that culture, you know, through the food, the music, we would go to different, um, you know, families' homes, uh, that that was very strong. Um, but I, I struggled watching her try to do all the things. Um, and so ironically, food was not sort of my calling from the very beginning. <laughs> um, I pursued a career in social justice for, you know, 15 years, really working in the nonprofit sector, really um, organizing different communities around finding their voice in their um, neighborhoods or on the job. And I felt like in that work, there was just something missing um, in different communities that were struggling. And when I went back to the Arab world in 2010, my dad invited me to come to him, come with him to Lebanon and Syria. 
I rediscovered all these things that in my childhood and being in diaspora took for granted. And those were the food spaces. You know, I had a lot of worry about being Arab American, going back to these places that they wouldn't accept me with open arms. And yet I felt this hospitality just envelope me, this like feeling of love. Anytime I stepped into someone's home and they offered me something to eat, or um, when I stepped into a bakery and saw that the baker was just like a part of the family. And I yearned to have that feeling. And I felt like it, in the work that I was doing in different communities here in the Bay Area, that that was the thing that was missing, that like feeling of warmth and hospitality. And so I came back from that trip and told myself I wanted to pursue a career in food simply to capture this feeling of connectedness and community building that I felt when I was in the Arab world. So, you know, my my sort of pursuing of food, obviously I love food and food is a delicious thing and it's a common connector, but it was really my love for community that that was the impetus for me making a huge career shift um, to do this work. Yeah, I... Uh, so much of what you said, Reem, really resonates with me. I think as a first-generation Palestinian American, there, for me personally, there uh, seems to be this constant um, desire to want to hold on to and preserve my culture. It feels like something that um, I'm always afraid to maybe kind of lose a part of um, with the older generation. And a big focus for me is how do I pass that on to um, the next generation, my son, who is um, half Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think food is such an integral part of our um, culture. And I think the way that you are um, preserving some of the Arab hospitality um, through your cookbook is a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, as someone who also has a palate, I call him a Palapino. He's half Pala Filipino. Um, yeah, it's really important that he knows where he is on that lineage and that, you know, we all have a place and we all have a story to tell whether we are back in the homeland or whether we're in diaspora and that food is this sort of transcendent thing that evolves and tells a really beautiful story about our resilience, how we've adapted. And a lot of my cookbook really was about talking about, you know, how the women, you know, and the men who came before me, um, you know, their circumstances were not easy. And sometimes the food adapted and told the story of that hardship. Um, but it also tells the story of creativity and um, seasonality. I mean, people tell me all the time, oh, your food is like a Californianized version of Arab food. And I said, Absolutely not. In Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, they cook seasonally, you know, and it's only because of, you know, the current things that we're dealing with, you know, whether it be climate change or war or occupation that we're not able to access those ingredients. So I feel very lucky to live in California where I can access those ingredients. And that is an important part of the preservation um, of our culture. So I, I feel very privileged to be a part of doing that. Yeah. Um, so that leads us actually really nicely into our next question. Aside from um, being a chef, you're really passionate about activism. So um, tell us a little bit more about your work in this space and um, what how that has evolved over the years. Yeah. Um, and you'll have to excuse me for my squeaky voice. This is the first week of um, my book tour. And so I did a, more talking than I've done in the last in person than I've done in the last two and a half years of pandemic. So, um, but yeah, I started, you know, I think for me, I always had an affinity for uh, what I call transformative organizing. I really love seeing the transformation of people, of somebody going from thinking, I can't, to I will. <laughs> I will change my destiny. I will step into my power. Um, and there have been multiple ways that people have done this in the course of history, especially in the US. You know, you think about 
black and brown struggles uh, for civil rights, for freedom, for self-determination. And as a Palestinian, I always had an affinity for that. And so I really wanted to do that in my community. And yet I felt like um, we're up against so much that we don't have this ability to imagine what the world that we're fighting for actually looks like. We just know what we don't want. <laughs> and I think food is this really interesting way of um, heightening the senses, taking down the barriers, getting us back into our bodies and our intuition of what we know to be uh, human. <laughs> uh, and I believe that it's the new frontier of organizing. People say, people call me an organizer turned chef. And I always say, well, I'm still an organizer. It's just that I use food as a medium <laughs> for organizing people. And so my food in particular, it was really important for me um, to use it as a tool for uh, starting a conversation, particularly around, um, at first, <laughs> what it means to be Arab. I think that the word Arab has been considered a bad word <laughs> in this country for so long. And the generations before me, I was very frustrated um, that, you know, they're labeling their restaurants, uh, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, not really saying the place that they came from. And I understand why they did it. And I, um, from this new generation where I have more privilege to you know, be more, you know, to be more upfront about it. But it was really important for me to change the discourse um, on Arab foodways. So that was first and foremost, my, um, my goal. But the second goal was this more transformative organizing work, which is to say that food and um, the right to culturally appropriate food that nourishes community that creates jobs um, that um, connects people across different cultures and experiences is also equally as important. That is what is going to get us to the social justice um, outcomes that we need <laughs> to change the course of history in this country. And so it became my mission over the course of the last 10 years not to just think about Arab food as just a medium to show people that, hey, we're here, we're Arabs, we exist, we're a beautiful people but also to say we have something to offer in this transformation of this country, right? And that if we can create spaces, my, my food is just as much about the spaces that you eat them in as it is about the food itself. If we can create spaces like the restaurants that I have now that people can come as they are <laughs> and they can just be who they are and they can feel a sense of belonging no matter where they're from, no matter whether they know anything about Arab food or not, then we can start to transform people's ways of being so that maybe when they walk out the doors of that space, they start to be that way in the other spaces that they're in. So, yeah, I think that those are my two goals <laughs> um, and they have been. Um, community is rooted in everything that I do. And yeah, and it's, it just happened to be food as my medium. <laughs> and we chose bread. Obviously, um, it's the lifeline of Arab history. <laughs> it's a constant living, evolving thing. And it's also a transcendent thing. It transcends cultures. Everybody loves bread. You know, every culture has some form of it. Um, and it also tr transcends uh, socioeconomic status, right? Like bread is for the rich and the poor and everything in between. And it's, so it's just, just this ultimate connector. It's this beautiful vessel for so many things. Wow. I, I love that. Bread is probably my favorite food group. Um, but I, I love, it is truly. Um, but I love what you said about it being something that transcends cultures and transcends um, socioeconomic status. Um, and personally, myself, you know, having grown up as a Palestinian American in a post 9-11 world, I really hear you on like the word Arab almost feeling as if it was like a bad word in a sense or something to be ashamed of. Um, so I love this concept of um, shifting the cultural narrative and like the societal narrative um, and food being a tool 
uh, in which to kind of initiate some of those conversations and take Mm -hmm. back ownership of our Arab identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to be proud of it, you know, I think that um, when I first started my restaurants and even as I was writing this cookbook, I was thinking about my audience, you know, and often, um, you know, often that audience is outside the Arab community, actually, because I want people to understand what Arabs have to offer and what we have been doing in this country for so long. But as a byproduct, it's it's an homage to my people. It's like a love letter to my people for some something for them to be proud of, um, for something for them to take their non-Arab friends to and say, like, look at this culture, you know, and something... For them, you know, I think for many of us, um, especially those who've been displaced from their homeland, they may not ever see home again. And so to be able to create a sense of home away from home um, became a very important piece of that work for me. Um, And so, yeah, I think that that, and the word Arab has become a little bit more mainstream now, you know, and I, 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 I would like to think that I was a trailblazer <laughs> um, in that effort. And you're seeing a lot more Palestinian chefs and Arab chefs um, come out there and really call its food what it is. So, yeah, I, I agree. I'm sensing that chef um, that it doesn't necessarily feel like it's, I, I do feel us as a community are taking back ownership of the word and um, shifting the connotation, which I'm very happy to see. Um, Looking back at your uh, career as a chef, so barely a year after opening Reams in 2017, you uh, went on to open a Arab fine dining concept called Diafa, um, which ended up earning a place on the Michelin Guide and uh, Bib Gourmand's list in its very first year. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, this journey? What inspired you to open um, Mm -hmm. a fine dining Arabic restaurant and um, how it all played out. Yeah. Um, so a year <laughs> into opening my first restaurant, um, I, I do not recommend this for anyone. So <laughs> do not try this at home, but, um, I managed to get pregnant. <laughs> I had a child on the way and, um, you know, Reams had gained a lot of national attention. It had earned uh, a spot on the top 10 restaurants uh, from food and wine uh, in the country. And there was a lot of attention being brought and on, on Arab cuisine and what I was trying to do. And um, at that time, um, I connected with a Michelin star chef at the time um, named Daniel Patterson. And he was um, opening sort of concepts uh, of restaurants and um, was interested in, um, you know, an Arabic uh, concept. And uh, the opportunity seemed really great. I think that um, the world of fine dining uh, does, you know, for better (laughs) or for worse, bring a lot of a lot more national attention than maybe just sort of a, a fine casual eatery might. Um, and it really, I think after being a business owner and being in the trenches uh, for so long, this idea of being creative and sort of taking this cuisine to another level and, and introducing the world, um, a national sort of audience to um, Arab cuisine or you know, in my mind at that time, thinking about elevated Arab cuisine um, was really, really intriguing. And we built this beautiful, beautiful space called the Afa. And the Afa is the Arabic word for hospitality. And it was successful right off the bat. And um, I had literally had my child, uh, I had had my child in March (laughs) of 2018 and opened Diafa about two and a half weeks later. And so to say the least, it was to run a really crazy, um, busy restaurant right off the bat being, you know, three weeks postpartum um, is nothing that I (laughs) recommend, (laughs) but I did it and I feel really proud. And it was this, um, it was an interesting experience. I think that, um, 
I think it was a sobering, the sobering reality of um, the model of fine dining, not really living true to the values that I was trying to build, which was an ethos that was really centered around workers um, and farmers and vendors. Um, I had a hard time um, sort of navigating myself in a world that I uh, wasn't a part of forming. Um, I, I am a baker by trade. I did not grow up, I did not come up in the hierarchical kitchens um, of fine dining. And uh, I came to start to see that that Arab, you know, my, my food was becoming more Europeanized or, you know, it was kind of a struggle to have like my true voice in portraying Arab cuisine. And, um, and it was just a realization that Arab food didn't need to be elevated. It was elevated in and of itself. And I would think back, you know, in this time that I was running this busy restaurant and, you know, struggling with all these power dynamics and fine dining that, you know, my grandmother would probably put some of these Michelin star chefs to shame that, you know, Arab cuisine is very, very sophisticated. And um, yeah, it, 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 became a struggle for me, honestly. And so I made a really, really tough decision in the fall of 2019 to sort of step away from that partnership and really focus on, um, you know, Reams where I had a lot more control. I was, you know, the sole owner and um, I had all these employees that had, you know, been there for two or three years and needed, um, you know, a pathway uh, to, to be leaders. And yeah, and I'm, you know, super grateful for that experience. Uh, but I think that um, I'm in the business of trying to shift the industry and some of these old notions of who has knowledge and who has power and uh, what the, the cost of food is worth, you know, what people are willing to pay for food. Uh, I think that a lot of ethnic cuisines as that you will, if you will, um, are considered to be less valuable, yet somebody will pay, you know, $20, $25 for a, a bowl of spaghetti <laughs> because it's, a you know, an Italian food, for instance. So, um, you know, at Reams, we're really trying to shift the consumer, um, you know, the consumer's idea of what they're willing to pay for for food that, you know, they're part of a whole ethos that's supporting uh, workers and also that you know the food is quite sophisticated and a lot of hands go into making it and it's all local and you know they should be paying top dollar for it so yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more uh, with regards to the um, how ethnic food tends to be undervalued um, I think about a, a traditional Arabic dish what a anab um, and mm -hmm. it's something that my mom makes often. She um, grows the grape leaves in her backyard. She um, jars and pickles them until they are ready, like creates the stuffing. It's, it is an unbelievably like laborious dish to prepare. Um, and so I really appreciate the um, drive to have folks value those kinds of dishes um yeah. for the labor of love that they truly are yeah and and also like honor the people who grow that food and work so hard to for you to have that experience you know like that doesn't just come you know like even in arab hospitality it's something that's in our blood but it's also a virtue it's a thing that we work for it's like even though my mom was like working around the clock, she always, you know, and I talk about this in the book, she always had like a, a bag of frozen spinach pies that she can take out with the drop of a dime. And these things are not easy to make, you know, and, and yet we do everything that we can to make sure that you, um, that whoever walks into our home or our spaces feel that abundance, right. And feel taken care of. Um, so there's something to be valued about that. Um, I, I agree completely. Uh, you spoke about this a little bit, um, about mm -hmm. putting your employees at the center of um, your business. Can you talk a little bit more about that and about how 
your identity has shaped your your career and your business decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I come from a long line of uh, freedom fighters, if you will. (laughs) My mom was like a feisty one. She was always fighting for her rights as a woman, for her rights as, you know, a new immigrant here in this country. And so I grew up watching her be an advocate to um, stand up for when something was unjust, to say something about it. And yeah, I don't know if it's like inherently because I'm Palestinian that (laughs) we fight for justice, but it was the values that I grew up with. And I think that my first sort of affinity for justice really came with um, going down to the deep South when I was a, a teenager and talking to Um, people who are on the front lines of the civil rights movement and just understanding what, um, what they did and what it took. And I knew then as a teenager, I wanted to devote my life um, to really making sure that people who, you know, were on the margins, so to speak, could be in the center because they have all this wisdom and all this knowledge Um, And I remember even when I was in college, like the janitors um, in college, they were, that was my first sort of introduction to union organizing, you know, fighting for the basic, you know, living wages. I mean, these folks were working around the clock to make sure that our university were clean and they didn't have enough to keep their, you know, to take care of their children. And so, yeah, I just... I kept doing that work over the years. I was a union organizer in the airports in the middle of Silicon Valley at San Jose International, watching, you know, security guards, people who are responsible for your security being paid $9 an hour in the middle of Silicon Valley. And, you know, I vowed to myself that, you know, if I were to start something that, um, it would really be a model that uplifted workers because I could see that when those workers that I worked with got their rights, um, they were better employees, that everything around them ran better, you know, that they were happier. And I think that's the same in food. When you walk into a food space and you see the employees are unhappy, that's going to impact you know, how they make your food and you don't feel that love or hospitality, right? Because they're not being treated with respect or love or hospitality. So I really, you know, I spent many years trying to convince developers and elected officials and God knows who, like, you know, when you create models for responsible development, when you ask those with money to put you know, to invest more in their workers and their surrounding community, everybody wins, you know, and they just could not see that. So I said, I'm going to go try to prove this on my own. Um, So it became kind of this like mission of mine of entrepreneurship of like, can I show a model um, that really proves that when you center employees, when you you know, um, create jobs that are dignified, that pay a living wage, that take care of them whole, whole, holistically, right? Their physical and their mental health, that everybody wins as a result of that. And um, I had the real privilege to, right out of culinary school, land a job at a cooperative called Ares Mendy Bakery Cooperative. So I got to um, learn how to not just be a baker, but an owner. We were all both workers and owners and seeing how sort of a democratic place works and it's a lot more work, but it yields so much more benefits um, for everybody. We had, you know, a really, really amazing retention rate and, um, you know, people had live work life balance and, you know, people are learning leadership skills. I was learning how to run payroll just as I was learning how to bake scones, you know? And so, I wanted to replicate that at Reams. And so I took sort of all of these experiences of my organizing and brought them into my business model. Um, And it hasn't been easy. The food industry is plagued, you know, with inequities. And, you know, those who work in the industry are majority, um, you know, BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. 
and um, they have lived their life for so long on the margins. And so for them to even internalize that they have a voice and they have something to offer more than just their hands or their bodies coming to work every day, um, you know, that takes a lot of work to unlearn. And, you know, at Reams, we're really trying to, to shift that, to shift that notion where me as the chef has all the answers. You know, I don't, you know, I've only been in this work for 10 years. Some of, you know, my prep cooks have been in this industry longer than me. And so we're trying to shift the model um, at Reams to be more worker led and worker owned. Um, and we're going through that process. The pandemic really <laughs> shifted my my focus to, to fast track that a little bit more. And, um, you know, we're, we are one of a few of people in the industry. There are a lot of folks now in the food industry that are questioning the model and starting to pay their workers more and um, starting to think of these models. And so, yeah, I think that that is the only thing that is going to change the food industry is when we start to ask the people who have been most hurt by it to be a part of the solution. So that's beautiful. I um I love the idea of decentering the power um in the like infrastructure that exists within um a restaurant and that is like one way of achieving social justice and bringing these folks that as you have said have historically been at the margins um recentering them um through this. So inspiring stuff. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh it's it's funny for someone who is on the front lines of organizing now to like be the boss, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and it's taken a long time for me to kind of find what is, you know, what is my role in all of this, you know, and I think at, at heart, I'm an organizer, and I'm a messenger, and I bring people together in different ways. And, you know, I hope that my cookbook really, uh, you know, shares that or that people can kind of see that and that it's infectious <laughs> and they can see parts of themselves in it that, you know, that this human experience, it's more universal than we think. And we all want to be change makers in our own way, whether we're in the food sector or the technology sector, and that we can all be thinking about, you know, these really important issues. Um, and so, yeah, it feels full circle. I feel like I was like, what, you know, where did this all come from? And I think part of it is just the experience of being Arab and diaspora, that experience of struggle. But I also think it's, you know, my parents taught me really good values. You know, the, when I was writing this cookbook, I learned that my dad, you know, was organizing people from when he was a teenager in the rural areas. And even though they didn't understand what an organizer was in this day and age, they know it in their hearts. They know what it means to build leadership in others. So I think that we all have an affinity for that in the various roles that we play in our communities. I love that. And um, I personally am so excited to pick up a copy of Arabiye um, and learn more about all of the many ways that um, your identity has impacted, um, has helped shape this book. It's um, going to be so much more than just, I think, a collection of recipes. Um, oh, so yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I mean, food is only, for me, food is delicious and you can make a recipe, but when you know the story behind a recipe and a context behind the recipe, it's just that much more special and delicious. And I hope that anybody who picks up this book will, will see that joy, you know, hardship and joy in the story. You have to have the yin and the yang. Um, but that they will feel inspired to invite friends over and to, you know, have dinner parties and to cook for more than just themselves. Um, that's really what this book, I hope, kind of brings to the world is this sort of joy in hosting and being hospitable. Yeah, that's beautiful and so core to Arab culture. Um, yes. Can you tell folks where they might be able to uh, pick up Arabiye? Yeah, so if you're uh, if you're local to San Francisco, you can always stop by Reams. We have signed copies here, but uh, Reams is sold wherever books are sold. Uh, you can 
pick it up off of Target or Amazon or any of the sort of online. But um, my personal plug is to always support your local bookstore in any city that you're in. So um, yeah, there are plenty of bookstores out there that are, um, you know, still thriving and kicking because of the communities that support them. So yeah, definitely pick up a copy and I'll be on book tour um, for the rest of the summer. So uh, if you check out or if you follow me on my Instagram, uh, reem seal or my restaurant, Reems California, uh, you'll know my whereabouts and hopefully we'll get to meet and connect more over this beautiful thing called Arab food. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Reem, for your time today. And it has been such a pleasure to learn more about you, about your book, Arabia. Um, and we really appreciate you helping us celebrate Arab Heritage Month here at Google. Thank you so much for having me.